engineering design process and we really stuck to it in order to stay on task and complete the project. Alright, in fact, over 60% of fish that swallow hooks in fish die after 24 hours after being released into the water. 50 million people go fishing in the United States. Recreational catch and release fishing often leads to the death of the fish. PETA agrees and seeks to ban recreational fishing for the pain it causes fish. This problem ranges throughout all bodies of water, but is really predominant in small ponds and lakes, uh, where the overall mortality rate of tournament caught <coughs> largemouth bass was 66%. Now that's a huge number. Now this might not seem like a huge, big problem, but we are part of a larger ecosystem and need to manage all bodies of water. So as you can see, this is a diagram that shows the hooked areas when fishing and the mortality rates for each. So lips and jaw, pretty low, moderately low, 7%, about 37%. But once you hit the gills, eye, esophagus, it's 100% mortality rate. <coughs> if you get it anywhere but the jaw or up, their fish is dead, which is a serious problem. Yeah, and here's another uh, chart talking about different types of fish after it swallowing hooks after 24 hours and their uh, percentage of living. Um, there's also problems with snagging. Um, this is the in illegal use of hooks. Uh, it's when <coughs> fishermen snag the reel back in hopes of catching the body of the fish. And this is a 100% mortality rate again if the fish is not of legal harvesting size. And it really <coughs> is a problem in a lot of states and is prohibited. So as you can see, this is nitrogen cycle. This basically represents how a fish factors into our ecosystem. And if you take the fish out of that equation, that can cause damage to the larger system. So that basically shows how important fish are to our lakes and ponds. Yeah, so here's uh, some of our competitors. Uh, once we get into the fishing industry, like you got all the big names, as you can see, it's a uh, very established market. This is our potential target market. Um, based on this graph, it's a huge market. Um, just bass, large and smallmouth is over a billion dollar market every year. And that's really what we were trying to focus on, but then there are also other fish that we can then sell to, um, and we have upwards of one and a half billion dollars that we can potentially go and do. So as you can see, our target market is 12 to 35 years old. We're mainly focusing on a younger fishing population because they aren't established in their ways. They're more open to new ideas as far as fishing goes. And it also is safer for the younger fishermen because if you have a little kid, you don't want them to be messing around with the hooks. People hook themselves all the time in the hands, and you just really want to keep them safe. So right here is just a visual that goes along with what just Cole just said, and it's talking about how we want to target the younger fishermen, but of course we want to target everyone, and how we want to target the pond fishermen uh, more than the lake fishermen, I mean the, 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 the bigger body of the lake fishermen, uh, because of the mass of so as you can see, this product does justification. Our product is ethically justified in that we are trying to prevent the killing of fish, which obviously is a good thing. And it also gives them more safe, it gives them a more environmentally friendly form of fishing and a safer one, not for the fish, but also for them, because people hook themselves all the time. It's a serious problem. And based on research, people have been open to this as we show. Uh, so these are just some of the prior solutions that we researched. We didn't want to infringe on any patents, so we researched those. And we also wanted to see what was out there to see what other solutions had tried in the past to help spur our ideas. So first we have the hookless lure. Um, this was only used for um, swordfish and really didn't work all that well, not a whole lot of sales. Um, the next is the Velcro lure. Um, that we will talk about a little more in depth later. And then we also have the traditional circle hook. And that's really the problem that we're trying to solve. So we want to do a little more research on how that worked and why it worked. Yeah, so here's that Velcro lure that we talked about earlier. Um, this is a, it was a product back in the 80s. And it is uh, no longer in use anymore. We, we actually had to go to a, a small fishing shop in uh, South Carolina to get our hands on one. And what it is, it is a, uh, is a jigging worm. Uh, that just has a little bit of uh, Velcro on the head of it, and it's not meant to be used uh, solely for Velcro use. It's not used, it's supposed to be used supplement with a, a fishing cup just to get that extra bread. And these are just some of the emails we had back and forth with Cole for lures, and then also Albany Bank Tackle, where we did go to buy lures. So as you can see, these are some of our early concept designs for our product, and we'll go through these. 
this is our scan for chart. We started off with a broader topic and tried to expand and narrow down what we were going to be trying to do in order to make our design process as efficient as possible. And this is all for organizations so that we can write down our ideas and really select the best one. So here are some of the justifications that we had of each different idea. This is the reverse bear trap. The spinner, we had an idea for a spinner. Uh, mesh bill justification, uh, essentially an entire ball covered with Velcro. The fish finger trap, that was a little more interesting. And also the hairy frog solution. This is one of the decision matrices that we made. Um, it really compared each product against each other and gave us an overall number at the end that we could see which one would perform the best based on these criteria. Yeah, now here's a focus group survey, and it's uh, this is just our first uh, thing that we got a little basis on who's uh, uh, being in this process. And so we had a um, majority of male and uh, a lot of beginner fishermen. This, this helped us find the target market. As you can see from the results, overwhelmingly the fuzzy frog won. However, we like did consider the other ones, but as you can see, 68% felt the fuzzy frog was the best because of its visual appeal and potential catching ability. Um, so from there, we compared the best three solutions, again, against each other to really ensure that we knew what we were going for with was going to be the best solution. So based on this, we saw that the finger trap and hairy frog were very, very close to each other. Um, we ended up choosing the fuzzy frog design um, due to the fact that we thought that it would really perform better and it's more viable solution. Yeah, now here's just a sketch of that. Um, this is our final product that we have. This uh, the product that we have in real life. If you go to the next slide, is the first one. And that was in order to communicate our ideas to others in a more visual manner versus us drawing things and just talking to them. As you see, we moved greatly away. So this is our expert design review from Mr. Phil Stock and Mr. Mark Guzman. They are local fishermen parts of clubs, and they gave us some great feedback on how we could improve our product. They said we could have more surface area for the velcro, added attraction to the fish. A big thing we got was that we need more surface area, and that by creating a more attractive lure, the fish will hold on to itself without having been caught, which would help with our product. Here we just have a concept of evolution. Uh, we started with that simple mock-up, just kind of looked like a slipper, not a whole lot. Um, next, we moved on to a hula popper design in order to get more of that attraction that the experts were talking about. And then at the end, we, we noticed that we still needed more surface area for the Velcro. So taking in what the experts said, we um, made it a full cylinder in the back in order to accommodate for that. And here's some of the other parts that were incorporated in that um, mock-up. And this is uh, the eyelet on which you uh, attach the fishing line to. And uh, here's just a little thing of the Velcro. And this is our final dimension drawing. Um, it is a full parts assembly, so we can see every part. Here we have some of the loads uh, before even starting uh, creating this final prototype, or intermediate prototype. Uh, we wanted to see if it would hold up to the stresses involved with the fish biting onto it. And that's with a 50 pound force on it. And as you can see, it's really holding up well. Um, we also looked at the displacement. And although it looks, based on this graph, like it is displaced a lot, um, if you look at the key there, it's less than one thirty-second of an inch. So it, it really doesn't move a whole lot. And the safety factor is also greater than one, meaning that it will remain elastic and that it will come back to its original position after putting that force on. And that's also the safety factor with 85 pounds, which based on the computer modeling would be our uh, limit. If you catch an 85 pound fish, you got to you have to show me some pictures. <laughs> um, throughout the process, we used some STEM principles, science, technology, engineering, math. Um, for engineering, we have the design process that we're following through. For science and technology, we have the 3D printing process um, that was essential in creating our prototypes. And we also, for math, have our von Mises forces um, involved in calculations for that safety factor that I said earlier. So as you can see, this is our final progression. We moved from the smaller one we got rid of the fins because they weren't as aerodynamic and they were also unnecessary. And we instead added eyes to make it look better. And we added a little rounded back at the top to help with the holding the velcro on. This is just the final dimension drawing. Yeah, and right here is just uh, pictures of that and how we, uh, we 
in uh, manufacturing these prototypes, we use 3D printing. We'll talk about it. So here we just have the build procedure. Um, it's pretty straightforward um, with the creation of the product on curated design. Um, you then print it out, and we had a couple of process about how you added the Velcro and the eyelet to the user. Yeah, and this just goes on and talks about the skirt, which is the actual Velcro part itself. And uh, just a bit of uh, how to bring a session back. Um, we also did contact the Velcro company manufacturing um, to see if they could apply the Velcro directly to our viewers. They said that they could, but they needed $15,000 in annual business. It's a little much for us right now. Um, so we asked them if we could apply it to just a couple of our prototypes, kind of as a donation. They said that they would need to set up a lot of equipment, so it wasn't able to be done. However, it is an option for um, private, for future manufacturing. She was welcome to it as well. Yeah, so here you see the materials and costs. In total, with like our incredibly inefficient process of 3D printing, it was about and here we have some of the manufacturing process. Um, our initial cost to set up would be $6,500 per mold. Um, we, we use a gas assisted mold in order to create a hollowed out center so that the, the wood would float. Um, some of our recurring costs, um, polypropylene plastic, plastic that we would be using. Um, our tooling and finish, the minimum wage employees, we do have to pay people to construct these. And you know, in total, it comes out to about $115,000 for annual production costs, um, assuming a decent product. Our industrial, yeah. Yeah, this is the industrial review. That's uh, by Roller Manufacturing, which is the company in which we got the quotes from on uh, the mold and the process itself. And uh, what they did for us is they uh, suggested the polypropylene and they uh, suggested a gas assisted mold, which is a little bit more expensive, but it allows our, uh, our model to be. Uh, hollow and So as you can see, this is our testing plan and procedure. We tried to run some tests with our weight capacity, which we'll show in a bit, and we also did a side-by-side -side comparison to try to figure out compared to other So this was our strength test. Um, what we did prior to going out to fishing was we put a five-pound weight um, attached to a sticky side of Velcro and attached that to our lure, the Velcro that you see on the lures that are in your hands. And um, it did hold five pounds very easily. Um, when we added a 2.5 pound weight, unfortunately we were only able to add it to one side, so it did fall off. However, if a fish was to bite with both sides of the mouth on each side, it would hold very easily. Um, that catfish right there is a five pound catfish held up with nothing but a thin strip of velcro. Yeah, so here's a, uh, you can see the cat same catfish, but here are uh, two different bass that it works with as well, which is our target fish. But um, through testing, we also found out that catfish root as well, which is a bonus. We did, we, did not, we did not catch those fish with those lures, but they were held up easily with them. So that just proves it's a proof of concept that it can work. Obviously, it's not top water season currently, which is very, makes it very difficult for us to test our product completely. So we did the extent that we could. Um, so at the conclusion, just some of the things that we learned. Uh, we definitely learned the importance of each step of the design process that we have been going through over in this presentation. We also learned the importance of documentation. All of that stuff that you have up there is a whole year's, uh, year of school's work. And we wrote down everything that we did, turned in stuff to our teacher, and really wanted to show what we did throughout this process. Here's a little bit of vocab. Um, which is uh, the company that was out to ban fishing, um, an angler, which is an avid fisherman, uh, hula popper, which is the mouth that we incorporate in our design that uh, adds a little bit more action, uh, polypropylene, which is the uh, plastic that we're using, um, epoxy, which is the adhesive that we use to attach the island to the metal, and uh, the fuzzy frog, which is the future of fishing. Special thanks to our many sources, Mark Guzman, Phil Stock, Culprit Lures for helping us, Alberdeen Bain Tackle, Jamie Ringenbach for assistance in engineering work, Velcro for their what little help they did give us, and of course, you, the judges, for your time and consideration.
And another existing solution is the sun shade. This kind of protects your vehicle from UV damage and keeps the interior um, out of the sun. And it's uh, sold in different sizes depending on the size of your car. And uh, this product protects more like the uh, interior of your car. It doesn't really cool the temperature. So that's how we And um, so we decided to use the recirculation button and the front ventilation fans. So the recirculation button in your car, if it's pressed, it only recirculates the air within your car. So we determined that the default setting of the button when it's not pressed allows uh, a way for air to flow in and out of the car. So that's how we designed our fan to suck air into the car and circulate the air. These are some of the STEM principles that we applied throughout this process. The law of thermodynamics, uh, because heat uh, uh, flows uh, cold to hot. We also applied the engineering process, modulus of elasticity to our chosen materials, and other things such as angular velocity, torque, and CFM. Uh, here are some of the experts that we had to contact. Uh, they helped us justify through our problem data that we Alright, so now that we've kind of started honing in on the product, we also need to figure out who we're going to sell it to, because that's a big part in how a product's designed. So we're trying to figure out our users and buyers. So obviously, we look, we're like we're in high school right now, and it was very easy to like find a target market, market of high schoolers, and also we leave our cars in the parking lot all day, almost every day, five days out of the week. So we decided that we're mostly going to target high schoolers, but also obviously parents will also go to work for the entire day and leave their car in a parking lot. Because 95% of the time you own your car, it's sitting in a parking lot, not actually being driven. And so we figured out that our total available market about high school to just basically any age, we decided, with just a stable income, like our product, our target cost is about $50, and it lasts as long as, like, like 10 years, so as long as a car. So you buy it with your car, and it's just, stays with that car, basically. And as, as Andrew said earlier, the average temperature of the US, of the entire US is 70 degrees throughout the summer. So, and that was already dangerous temperature. So it can be anywhere in the US this product can be used. Uh, this is a survey that we developed in order to uh, justify that our problem was a viable solution. And these are our design specifications. So as we moved on with the product, we determined that um, the customer needs would be to regulate the temperatures in the vehicle. And performance-wise, it would be to fully circulate the interior of the vehicle throughout the day while the car is not on. And the target cost we determined would be um, $50 or, equal to, or less than or equal to $50. And the size and weight we determined would be, it would have to be light in case of like some sort of accident, so it wouldn't do any harm to the the car. All right, so based on those, all those criteria, we decided that with that criteria, we're going to constrain our product to certain, to certain limits. Like, we could not build outside these limits because we had to figure out how we're going to, like, start forming this product, not just, like, the idea of it. So obviously, like, we wanted under a pound. We wanted under $50. We wanted, like, a certain dimension, like, based on, like, the, a car fan. We don't want it to just be, like, the huge, like, the entire dash of the car. So we constrained our product and it started taking shape. So we also mapped out this process to figure out like, like what, exactly what route we're gonna go. We figured out that like, hey, we want it to be on the front ventilation fan because that's near a lot of exits like for air and also for cooling the car and also, um, and also like it's like it's the most convenient place just to hang it. We we came up with clips to hang it on the vent very conveniently. From the scamper, we developed multiple solutions. As you can see here, this is our adhesive fan that would almost stick around the car vent. And uh, this is a suction fan that could uh, suck to the dashboard of the car. And we chose different designs to be aesthetically pleasing. As you can see here, here's the hook fan that could simply hook to one of the mounts and the uh, clip fan. So we put all these into a decision matrix and we found our top three. And as you can see, that the uh, front ventilation fan was the winner. We also did another market survey in order to uh, see which solution was the best and more, uh, most aesthetically pleasing, and the clip fan for that as well. So 
So this is our mock-up, and this is how we determine what our final product would look like. Um, making this, we found out that it was on the smaller side, and it wasn't able to include all of the components that we needed for our final product, but it was helpful for our final solution, and it was All right, so now that we have our mock up, we're going to start testing things to figure out, like, hey, what exactly do we need to change? Like, so the first thing we decided to test was the mounting. Obviously, we can't just have it falling off the falling off the car vent. So we figured out with some physics equation, we figured out that we need 6.225 newtons of force, like those clips that we will be able to withstand that, and we tested it, and it, it was, it's easily do that. It's a very small force to just hold up this thing due to gravity. So there's nothing like impacting this like constantly like if you bump it or something it will hold up pretty easily and also our the fan we we, we bought the fan and it, on the fan it says it's a 30,000 hour product life and we just did some we just did some simple math and we figured out that hey so that means this fan will last just over 10 years and our target life was 10 years which is the average life you keep a car so basically you buy this product and you can have it for the entire life of your car so that's a good a good life for the fan and also there's stress analysis. These look bad, but like that's like like 30 seconds of an inch, so clearly gravity is not gonna like just destroy us, and that's obviously what we want. We also had to test the size and weight. As you can see the equation right there, it's 0.933 pounds. And this is how we determined um, if it would pass our target cost. And you can see those are all the parts of our design. And um, so it ended up being $49.25. And then on the next slide, um, this is how we determined how much our 3D printed material would cost. Um, we used Autodesk for the venture, and it was able to tell us how much material we would use and what the cost of that would be. And throughout all those tests, we determined that our uh, tests were within the initial design of the and using the, um, Newton's law of cooling, we figured out that after it's hard to see here, but after 60 after 60 minutes of just like just the fan working, you can bring the car from 104 back down to almost almost down to like the 70 degrees it started at. So obviously it wouldn't be perfect. Like there's still gonna, the heat's still going to be outside, and like the fan's not going to be able to perfectly draw in outside air. But 60 minutes is actually pretty good, and you'll be gone for around eight hours. So this will actually really help reduce. How, how fast your car will heat up throughout the day and it will stay at a reasonably com comfortable temperature. And also we figured out that, so a car, when you're just sitting there and you have the AC on, it can blow 60 cubic feet a minute. And we figured out that our fan can blow 50 cubic feet a minute. So it's very close to like that target we want. So instead of just having your car on all day, you can now instead have this fan on to be charged and cool your car instead. This is some of the prototype testing that we did. We did it on a moderately hot day. Obviously, uh, this spring wasn't as good as the conditions that we had before. It was still rainy. We had to do it in a controlled environment. So as we did each take, we had to reset the car environment, let it heat up again from the sun. And we tested it on low and high with the knob each time. So uh, it got uh, down to around 5 degrees every time. And this is our uh, final mock-up. As you can see, it's very large compared to our initial design. This was to account for a larger battery. Uh, we made clips and a suction skirt so air can escape. Yeah. And obviously there's still things we need to work on. Like the fan we got has a cord that's like five feet long because it's a USB thing. We couldn't we couldn't like splice the cables or anything. It wouldn't because the, the micro cables and we couldn't figure out how to do that. So obviously we didn't have to invest in like further technology with like different fan cordage and stuff that wouldn't be like a burden to use. And this is the data we collected. So on the far column, it shows the benchmarks and place what we needed to reach in order to validate a problem for our solution. And um, over here is the degree of accuracy, which shows how much our product did pass by. These are some of the key terms that we do apply throughout our presentation. Ambient temperature, thermodynamics, uh, displacement, CFM, which is cubic feet per minute, which is how we measure uh, how much air the fan moves. In conclusion, we'd have a few things change about our final product. We'd actually like to make it slimmer and more lightweight so it blend in uh, with the dashboard. We'd also like to have a larger battery capacity. 
And uh, we also like the clips to move and rotate, so it would be uh, applicable to multiple different uh, car vents, for example. Mini Coopers have circular vents. Designed to be used on horses and other similar animals to get burrs out of their hair. Uh, so it's up like a brush and just fly it through the hair and uh, it removes the burrs in that way. Most reviews are very high for like uh, four reviews out of five stars. And uh, obviously, this is like targeted for a very niche market for uh, horse users. And so it's very highly rated among them. Uh, it's designed for animal hair, but it isn't uh, entirely effective for things that either aren't on uh, animal hair, such as clothing. Or smaller birds. So after looking at some part solutions, we just want to um, brainstorm that many ideas that it's possible. So starting with the idea of a bird removal tool, we branched off into a metal claw, we would use a wood run down any affected surfaces, a brush block, a detachment spray with a utilized chemical engineering to create some uh, chemical that, that birds were sticking, a velcro pad, a velcro wand controller, which uh, were similar that they would utilize velcro um, to use or run down surfaces for the birds. Push release brush, which the user would attach that to the surface and then they would be able to push the button that would release first as desired. And finally, they'll pick up where the user would put on some apparatus um, and pick it to run down the product that's on any surface to remove. Uh, here is our uh, final decision matrix. We were uh, comparing the various design options. And the one that uh, is at the highest rating overall is a slide of the tool relative to the one. So here we have our first iteration that we designed. Uh, down at the bottom you can see some Autodesk inventor uh, pictures that we made in addition to our original uh, prototype drawings and uh, dimensions of our Autodesk design. Uh, we decided to work with a, a wedge <coughs> design. As you can see, the main part of it right here is the wedge that operates by sliding the wedge underneath the bird to pry it out. We also included a long handle to make uh, wedging it out easier and a hole for the very top which would provide a uh, nice place to grab a string or simply So after working off of that uh, first iteration, we uh, grew out on a bit of uh, learn from some of its flaws. Um, we changed the design to make use of, uh, of the wedge, but this time have two wedges. One, as you see in the front, is bigger, with bigger grooves, and one in the back, for smaller grooves. Um, and as you see, it's flatter and wider, so the user can easily transport it, uh, such as putting it in their pocket. We also added Velcro to the top to add further functionality. After the user slid the burger, um, slid the product across the clothing, they could use the Velcro to pick up any loose ends that were left behind. Uh, here were some sketches from when we were designing our mock-up. There is detail in previously mentioned designs, as well as uh, adding handles to the the newest iteration. Here we have our first mock-up. It's designed in Autodesk Inventor. Uh, you can see it right here. Uh, it was similar to the second iteration. Um, a few improvements that we made. First of all, handles were added in order to uh, make it less likely to, for the birds to come into contact with their hands. This is one of the recommendations of our fellow students and teacher. And uh, we also uh, kept all other features, such as the uh, two white hands. As you can see, um, this is the mock-up. Um, once we 3 printed it based off of that CAD file, um, we tested it a little bit. We put it on our hands. We slowed it down. It worked pretty well. We were able to use the larger size for the larger ears, the smaller size for the smaller ears, um, and we think it fulfilled its purpose. And then uh, our mock-up continued our product description. The underbrush is a small tool which ride birds away by squeezing them between two windows. It is effective on a wide variety of fur and fabrics. It is made of APS plastic. Operation. The user grips the handle of the underbrush and slides it across any affected surface. The targeted fur is wedged off of the surface and is temporarily held in the tool. Finally, the fur may be removed from the tool. The light shake the tool. Uh, after we have analyzed the liability of our proposed solution, uh, moral obligations wise, we have user safety in mind to make sure that when they come in contact with these birds, 
There's no threat of injury to other plants or other parts of their body. There are also regulations involved, such as worker safety regulations, where to make sure that when it's in production, that there's no risk posed to workers in the manufacturing process. And lastly, we wanted to consider the regulations of environment and regulations and EPA inspections. And this involves uh, big waste of the environment and damage to the environment, which we took all these into account in the design. So, uh, kind of working, uh, after working on the mock-up, we looked for the common design. Um, the one major change that we made was we reduced the size of the significantly. Um, this was made to increase the portability of the device, as it is going to be something that users take into the outdoors. Um, we also added additional grounds to some of the corners so it wouldn't uh, hurt users and to increase the ergonomics. Finally, for our building purposes, we added, uh, we lost the name of our products and the other products inside the product. Our estimated price. The price of the ABS plastic per pound is enough. The weight of the product is 1.42 kilograms, approximately 20th of a kilogram. The price of the ABS plastic per product is 5 cents. The price of Velcro per inch squared is 7 cents. The surface area of Velcro products per inch squared, the price of Velcro per product is 28 cents. The total price of materials is So that's very 
is a growth through pocket. Um, we continue the trend of having the larger wedge on one side and the smaller wedge on the other. Um, and the patcher building three friends three friends of auto we've got on the top. Uh, STEM principles utilized. Uh, scientific principles we calculate durability from stress testing. We use material science to determine the best materials to use for our product. And we use the survey to assist in determining the most appealing characteristics of our product. Uh, our technological applications include utilizing inventor for 3D modeling and analysis. We also use online resources such as Google Drive and Innovation Portal to effectively organize our information. And we use 3D printer to create our model. Continue our STEM principles. Uh, for engineering principles, we use an engineering design to a process to guide our process throughout the year. We also use mechanical engineering to get a better design and economics of the design. And we apply proper documentary uh, techniques in foggy, such as the bar vision. Uh, for mathematical principles, we research the price materials and calculated the price of it based on that. We use the mentor and calipers for the net really measured parts. And lastly, we use the decision matrix in order to analyze the different ideas we had in so this is our VN chart. It gives us a good rundown of uh, how we went from about October uh, up to now. Um, as you can see, we, spent, uh, we divided up the working of the products and getting those planning, researching the problems, justifying the problem, transitioning to uh, brainstorming, uh, settling up with the problem. And the final stage is developing that product in reality, testing it, and determining uh, its viability in the market. We want to thank you, Mr. Scora. Thank you. And the USDA department, the USDA, for uh, providing excellent background information. We believe we have uh, created a product that successfully addresses our problem. Testing has indicated that there are only minor features that we should tweak in the final product. We look forward to future developments. Yeah. Future developments, yeah. Great stuff, right? So when it comes to our product, we've been very successful in our final iteration. As you see here, we have our final design. Uh, where it's just an intent and it flips over. You got one side you can use for sliding motion to wedge it off, the other side for uh, Velcro. If I demonstrate it here, on these bursts stuck to uh, felt on our poster. This next one is a UV sweep, where it falls off like so. And you remove the final bars that are stuck there, your final bars, these things to you. Light brushes, and they're all off. And that's our product. Not cause a vacuum to be in the system, and then you're, uh, that's connected to the check engine light. 
which will uh, trigger the text set. Uh, the problem with the two system is uh, the capital system has to be installed in the card at the start. So it has to be out of the dealership with the capital system. And also only uh, two or three manufacturers have proceeded with this idea and it's relatively new. Especially with uh, the common card being 11 years old, this uh, definitely is not a system that has been introduced into the market as of right now. And then the EVAP system is very misleading with just a check-in device because check-in device can be a just the cap being broken, or you could have a fuel leak, or you could have a engine problem misfire. So it's an assortment of things, and it's all at one. Like, and the average user doesn't know what they or doesn't know the, what the check engine light means. They think to a mechanic when they read them, but they need to. And we found that uh, a lot of people don't trust the mechanics, unfortunately, because they've been victims of scamming and uh, mistreatment by them, and often have to pay a, a lot of money. <coughs> you know, not just for missing reading, but also for checking. It's a what fifty-five dollar minimum fee to go to the dealership and have them check the lights or check the pump. Um. So some design specifications that we had when we were trying to build this, uh, we needed it to be universal. That way, it could fit into any car or make or model. Um, it had to be cost efficient and be able to clearly alert the driver that the gas cap or the fuel door is not open. We also needed it be to be resistant to water and gasoline, especially because those are the type of contaminants or stuff that can get on it. Uh, All right, so since this is some of the concepts, uh, we developed uh, three main concepts. Uh, the first one right here is, is the retractable and signaling system. So it has a retractable mechanical system which will connect to the gas cap and there's an electrical system which connects to the, the door. It's uh, determined by the door. So what happens is when you come and all out of your gas cap, it will retract into the transmitter uh, transmit system and it will cause it so that you cannot close your door easily without installing your gas cap on. And then there's an electrical system that detects that the door has been open. And if the door has been left open, then you obviously have not installed your gas cap back on. And that alerts uh, that, hey, you need to go install your gas cap. Uh, and then the other concept we have is a double electrical system. And what that is, is it uh, gets rid of the retractable system and replaces it with an elect uh, electrical system for the gas cap and stuff too. Uh, the last system we developed was a vacuum system. So we wanted to take that EVAP kind of idea and put it for just the cap itself. So the cap would have a bit of a vacuum technology system that would detect if there is a vacuum closed. And if there isn't a vacuum that's closed, it will send a signal to the uh, receiver in the dashboard area, the behind the driver, that you have not installed the gas cap. Uh, so, and finally, we decided to go with the retractable and electrical system because the double electrical system, we ran into problems with having the uh, electrical system because it is very challenging to work with, especially in a small area like this. And also, there's very, uh, some risk with uh, static charge, especially in an area where there is gas. <coughs> so we don't want any potential fires or any better risk of potential fires occurring. And then the vacuum system is just uh, there's too much technology for our time right now. It's a, it would be a very complicated system that we have to develop. And there's no current technology that's truly going to be able to implement to our design. So in the end, we decided to go with the retractable and electrical system to let best optimize both the simplicity but also be able to get a certain across. So this is the prototype that we designed. This right here is the receiver, which will go into your dashboard area. This is what you plug into your cigarette lighter. Show them to the judges. Uh, and this right here is, uh, is our transmit. This is what you put in your gas cap area. It may look big on here, but it's actually only about two inches by uh, one inch by 0.5 inch size. Uh, here are some of the CAD drawings that we have with it. All right, so uh, the circuit um, was very complicated to make. Unfortunately, we weren't able to completely get it to work. So we currently right now have a blown up version of it um, using an Arduino. So you guys see the red and green lights over here? So basically, the whole concept of it is that when your gas cap is open, the red light will um, be on, and basically that means that your gas cap is left open. When you click this button right here, 
it turns off sending a signal uh, that you're, you're telling you that your gas cap is now closed and you're going to go. Uh, so some of the, this is a basic circuit. This is a RF transmitter circuit, which has a transmitter and a receiver. And uh, we, we're going to tweak this circuit. We were planning on tweaking this a bit. So uh, instead of a push button, we would uh, use a Hall effect sensor, which is basically a magnetic sensor. So we would have a magnet here on the door, so that, uh, and then on the tr uh, transmitter itself, there's a magnetic sensor. And it, when it detects the magnet is there, it closes the circuit, and uh, it will send the signal that hey, we're good to go. Uh, also, we would add, also add some inverter gates to it because we want to invert the signal. So if it's open, we want it to invert it to send a signal to the receiver itself, and then vice versa for if you were to install it properly. And uh, also, we would have wanted to miniaturize this a lot more, uh, make it to a micro scale, which we do not have the technology right now to try. We attempted to do uh, little copper plates, and uh, we just found it a very big hassle. Right? We don't have the technology right now to go along with that. Uh, this is the budget that we have. Um, most of this budget was the electrical components. But you can see, it may look like a long list, but a lot of them are like uh, 12 cents, 4 cents, uh, even 1 cent, some of them half cents. And a lot of this resistors, inductors, capacitors, LEDs. And uh, the total we have. Uh, we got for $8.84 uh, $8 to build both the transmitter and the receiver system, including the plastic itself. That's not including the cost of uh, labor. This is solely just the parts. Okay, so we uh, 3D printed our prototype. Uh, just right up here, as you can see, uh, this is our very first mock-up, um, which is very simple. Plug into your cigarette lighter in your car. And eventually we made this modification uh, where we wanted to create a circular component for our receiver. <laughs> Stick it in here and then just screw around to that part. And then our final design was to have um, this. So this incorporates two USBs on it and the green light and the red light. And basically it screws on and off to it. And off, but if there's ever a and also uh, for the transmitter itself, we've blown it up to proportion to scale up for our model. And right here we have the retractable system, which simply retracts forward. And uh, this would be where the circuitry would go. Of course, it's a blown up version of the display. Not only the retractable system, but also where the is going to be for the <coughs> So this is the code for Arduino. Um, it's just simple binary sending. Um, it might not look simple for you guys, but it's. Um, so it's just simply saying, hey, you know, if a uh, if a signal is sent with a one, that's going to show up the LED. And if the signal is sent with a zero, which represents a low, it will turn on the LED saying that your circuit is. So this is the test plane we developed. So uh, Robbie and I set up the test plane for ourselves. Uh, so Robbie uh, set up the, the water and the gasoline transmitter. So what he did basically was pour the water and gasoline on our transmitter assembly, which I believe we have right here. This, we tested this. So this is uh, our mock-up model that we tested with. And then uh, I was testing the retractable system, make sure that is a quality. And then uh, lastly, uh, Robbie drove around with the transmitter in his car itself just to see that if it was to hold up to the elements. So uh, these pictures are all taken. This is a picture of it just being run underwater. Um, the second picture is gasoline being poured on it. And the third picture is after the gasoline and water being poured on it. And after we're waiting for it to dry and cleaning it up, we found that uh, to see they hold up against the gasoline and water variable. Yeah, it's success. Uh, we did some stress tests towards uh, the retractable system, and we were struggling to put like, smaller forces on the on our uh, testing <coughs> software, so we went a little harsher. It may look a little harsh here, but as it goes more to the extreme, but uh, with our testing, we figured out that 
indeed the transmitter assembly would hold up to a uh, multitude of retracting and contracting. And then uh, finally, just a basic stress test on our cigarette lighter because people will be taking on and off the cigarette lighter uh, for other needs if they have to charge a phone or need to plug in another device. So we made sure that uh, our cigarette lighter design was going to hold up the test of time. These are the STEM uh, principles that we use, the HDP3 plastic uh, that we chose because it was the most durable that we thought for our product, the circuit uh, with technology, and the design process was engineering the whole thing and it, brainstorming it, and putting all the pieces together, and mathematics was measuring, being able to see how big it could be uh, for the transmitter to be within the gas cap area, and how big it could be. Uh, we reached out to experts. Uh, one of our experts actually was Mr. Scorch by the Raymond Scorch. And uh, he was the one to actually recommend us to switch out. We originally had a, a lead to our gas cap, so there would be one lead here and another lead here. And when the leads would connect, it would send the signal. But uh, he told us that over time, uh, corrosion and rust may get to it and may deteriorate the system. So he actually recommended us to implement the Hall effect sensor. And uh, also, this is uh, Michael Kelly. He's an engineer, an electrical engineer, and uh, he was also a big help to us, kind of helping us organize how we would uh, go about designing our circuit and how we could try to build it. Uh, fortunately, we weren't able to, but he was a major help in attempt. Okay. Uh, right here, we had our automotive teacher, uh, uh, Mr. Meyer, look over some of our more technical aspects of the car. So he uh, helped us inform on. Uh, the dashboard area and how it works and also uh, how much space typically gas cap areas work and he also did help to explain how the EVAP system works on the most of makes and models. Uh, the marketing plan. So initial, uh, so after we were able to mid, uh, reach experts and miniaturize our uh, circuitry and get everything working the way we wanted to, we would either try to get this license to one of the big uh, automotive companies, whether it be in Asia with the Toyota, or uh, Hyundai, or here in America with like GM, or Ford, or even in Europe. And uh, we would either do that, or we would actually try to sell it ourselves on the online website and try to keep the profits mostly for us. And uh, we would take this uh, manufacturing overseas, and uh, it's about $10 for parts and uh, flavors combined together. And uh, to make profit, we have to triple that for now, so the profit would be about 20 to $30. And eventually, when we go into bulks of 50,000 to 100,000 units, we would be able to obviously uh, lower that to about uh, $19.99, which is a very ideal price for a product like this. Percent of diseases are linked to poor water and sanitation conditions worldwide. Access to improved sources is scarce, especially for uh, poor, like poor rural African uh, countries and areas. Uh, the average distance that people in these areas walk for water is upwards of uh, as much as six kilometers to the source. That would be a huge well round trip to get to the source. And uh, in most parts of the world, as many as 20 meters of water are then consequently carried from the top of the head to the usual knee. And that places strain on both the head and back in the neck. After doing all this research, we were able to devise a problem statement, and our problem statement states that the purpose of this project is to develop a solution that allows people in Africa to sanitize when it water sources for drinking, cleaning, and other everyday uses. So this brings us into our market research, which uh, obviously one of our biggest, uh, one of the biggest problems we encountered early on is that our access being uh, in rural Africa is on the other side of the world, which makes uh, contact and uh, especially direct contact very difficult. But uh, we decided that our practice would basically be people of all ages, and mostly rural Africa, who lack this immediate uh, access to water. <coughs> These people most likely have uh, very little to no income and uh, at most a high school education given the poverty in uh, our primary market. And uh, as I said before, the United Nations believes there are at least 783 million people in the world without access to clean water. Those mostly being, as you can see, Africa and Asia. So after uh, using all that information, we decided to look into the market and also look at some existing solutions already. Uh, 
So five primary ones that we found were the leg straw, where you can simply drink from the straw and able to drink from any water source and it'll be, uh, give you filtered water. And also the cyclically, which is able to purify water just by simply pedaling the bike. And also the life sack, which is able to use UVA radiation from the sun to purify its water. And so examining its design viability, this is uh, what we used to get started. But after a while, we concluded that due to our group's overall lack of resources as well as knowledge of water filtration technology, that we wouldn't be able to substantially improve upon the water filter, make any uh, other substantial improvement that would make our design feasible. So we instead decided to uh, re-examine the original problems we found. And instead we decided kind of like to uh, instead develop a solution that could be used to then transport water as opposed to uh, carrying it on top of the head. This was one of our main issues before, the distance for people were giving for water. And we decided that coming up with a solution to uh, ease this uh, means of transportation and make it more safe and ergonomic was much more within our group's abilities as well as just more, much more obtainable given our uh, resources as well as time constraint being the school year itself. Because we're now focusing more on water transportation, we're able to devise a new problem statement, which now states that the purpose of this project is to develop a solution that allows people in rural Africa to transport water over a long distance while placing as little strain on the body as possible. Uh, so then we have a, uh, before we really got into brainstorming, we uh, came up with some solution requirements or uh, criteria that our solution would need to meet to uh, actually solve the problem. Uh, first, obviously, these place very little strain on the body. Uh, obviously, they can't place strain on the head or neck or spine. Um, due to the research we found before, it should be able to hold at least 15 liters of water, which uh, that is heavy. That weighs about uh, one liter of water is about one kilogram or 2.2 pounds. Uh, our product should also be inexpensive and easy to mass produce, so we can reach as many people as possible in as many communities. It should be uh, comfortable used to be able to walk as far as 10 kilometers. Uh, it should be used uh, possibly possible for other meaningful tasks after you, so it can be recycled and used for things like uh, storage of other uh, food stuffs, for example. It should be uh, easy to use and operate, and uh, we also want to be durable with something that will last <coughs> and make a meaningful impact in these communities for a good amount of time. So after using all those uh, requirements, we were able to now generate concepts and move forward to selecting them. Uh, so then we devised a scamper chart, um, expanding more on the water solution transportation idea and branching out and creating more uh, ideas and concepts and like all the pictures and all uh, kind of describing what they should do and what they can. Uh, so, our first, so our first concept was the life jacket. Uh, if you know a typical life preserver, you hang it around your neck and you're able to inflate it with air. Uh, this one, you would fill it up with water and it will also allow you to use your hands and also just simply walk around with it. For our second concept, um, it would be a lot like the uh, water jacket, but this time it would also use the front and the back and also have straps around the torso so you can bring the water closer to you without the water swooshing around and making it uncomfortable. And then our third concept was a sack backpack. This is pretty common in the market today where camelbacks um, but this one, you can fill it up with water and it's able to have a cap at the bottom to dispense water and the cap may also be used as a water filter. Uh, so after generating all those concepts, we decided to uh, create a decision matrix and then we used all the, uh, to score all the concepts we had, we had uh, design specifications, uh, which were just our solution requirements as mentioned earlier. And so we gave a score for how well each of the concepts did according to the specification. <coughs> Tallying all the votes, we were able to uh, announce that the sack backpack was the best one narrowly. Uh, because the results were so close uh, between the life vest and also the uh, sack backpack, we decided to uh, create a hybrid jacket vest combo, uh, which would take the idea of inflating the water jacket with water, but then also using the life vest and using how it uses the front of the body and also the back of the body to create more water support. Uh, so after doing that, we decided to put the jacket vest combo or the water vest against the sack backpack. And using the same design specifications as before, we then uh, gave scores according to both concepts and then we were able to decide that the jacket vest combo was our best solution. Uh, so after moving forward with the jacket vest combo or water vest, we were then able to create a rough sketch 
as you can see, this is a drawing of what the flat work of the vest would look like, and also for uh, what the cap uh, top and cap bottom would look like as they would attach to this. Uh, so then we created on Autodesk Inventor some 3D models, uh, one for the vest over there on the far left, and then also what the cap top would look like, and also what the cap bottom would look like. And the cap top and the cap bottom would attach to each other, and then they would both attach to the cap uh, to the to the vest. <coughs> and then also after we created those individual parts, we were able to assemble all of them together in making uh, the 3D assembly you see there on the far left, and then we were able to uh, show how it attaches to each other on the exploded uh, assembly here. Uh, after creating all those 3D models, we were then able to create um, some drawings, uh, just specify some measurements of the vest there on the left, and it also shows some isometric and perspective views of the, of the vest assembly here. And then you can also see some measurements specifically for the cap bottom there on the, le on the left, and then also the cap top here. Alright, so now, now we move to our uh, manufacturing of our actual prototype. First of all, we have our bill of materials here. This was the total cost required to make our prototype. Uh, we we'll used, we'll get into our materials a little more in a moment. We used a bit of plastic polyethylene for the vest itself, ABS plastic for the 3D printing cap, and uh, we used a Loctite super glue to actually fasten that the cap to the vest. Uh, similarly, here's our required equipment that we need. A uh, 3D printer we did have at the school, so that wasn't an issue. But one of the things we kind of uh, struggled with at first was uh, figuring out how we fasten the vest. To do that, we used uh, what's called heat sealing technology, and that's actually what we use to make the uh, heat seals on the vest here. We do not have a heat sealer at the school. It's something that's often used in packaging, but it was uh, kind of difficult to come by and detail that. So here's our uh, justification materials. As said, the vest uses a uh, polyethylene plastic, which is a great material for the vest because it's very durable and resistant to tearing. It also has a pretty high uh, melting temperature, which is important given that it's going to be used in a very hot area. The one uh, downside is that it does take some time, a very long time, to decompose, but uh, that's the case with many plastics, and our product can also be reused after its uh, initial product life cycle. Uh, we use ABS plastic then for the cap itself, which uh, is a benefit as well. First of all, it lends itself great to 3D printing, which was uh, how we uh, manufacture our actual cap. It's also uh, very sturdy, which is important given that all the water is going to be you know, entering and mixing through that cap, making it a very desirable material. Okay, so looking at fasteners here, uh, heat sealing, you can actually see a picture of a heat sealer on the bottom left there. What it does is it actually rolls over the vest and uh, but basically it melts two layers of plastic together. So this was a very good choice for fastening the actual vest itself because it's not only easy to use, but it also seals the actual material together, which creates a strong and, more importantly, watertight seal. Uh, so the glue we used for the actual vest was very effective as it uh, fastens the cap firmly to the vest. Um, it does take some time to dry, but the fit is very durable and it's uh, ideal for a product. Here is this uh, briefly 3D printed cap. We used our uh, seals equipment, and uh, we did run into some difficulty initially getting it to work, but uh, the cap did turn out very nicely. And uh, here is the sealing device. Initially, to try and get an actual heat sealer, we reached out to some uh, local companies with the help of a uh, teacher, Mr. Scora. We were not able to get any of this by uh, contacting some companies like uh, Demonte Plastics, but we were able to uh, actually create a bit of a makeshift solution, you can say, by using a wood burner. You can see here, we were able to use that in lieu of an actual formal heat sealer to create bonds. And actually, we have a scrap piece right here. You can, uh, you can see that the bond itself is very durable and well for our vest. So then we get into the actual prototype here. You can see it pushed above. Yep, so after we created our prototype uh, using PC, uh, we were able to uh, design some uh, test criteria that we wanted to uh, find out from the vest. So specifically, if our cap fastens securely to the vest, um, if our vest can hold at least 15 liters or more of water without leaking, and a vest that can be carried for two kilometers without, without fail, and then also the user feels comfortable while carrying the vest. 
Okay, so there is yours truly the best. This was, uh, we actually tested it, and this is filled up with 15 liters of water, which doesn't seem like a lot, but the best was able to uh, very effectively carry that. Our prototype uh, did not work, it was very uh, effective. You can see the whole front view, inside views of the actual build up vest resting uh, squarely on the shoulders and distributing the weight across the body as opposed to a critical area like the uh, neck. We can also hold uh, more weight, uh, more water, um, to we did not test. <coughs> Um, so for this testing, uh, as you can see, we fill it a bucket up with water, um, and then we then put the water into the vest uh, through the cap, and then also you can see us dispensing the water here into back into the bucket. Um, and then as we said before, this vest was able to carry 15 liters. So here are our test results. Here we found that. Uh, was able to hit effectively on all the requirements we mentioned before. Wearing the vest itself, uh, actually I was the one who had tested it, it is, you can feel the weight of the vest in the water, but it's actually, uh, I think, comparable to a backpack or a hiking pack, and then you can feel the weight, but it's comfortable to move around with. One thing we did notice is that while walking with the vest, the water moving as you move kind of uh, moves the vest around, and uh, that makes it a little difficult to uh, quickly with, though we are considering uh, something like putting a waist strap that would actually bring the vest closer to the body. We make up uh, Smart Tech Incorporated uh, under the instruction of Steve Scorp and Lomanzi Valley PLT program. Uh, we're working, uh, we've worked as a team really to create a solution for an evolving world. Um, in this presentation, uh, we seek to illustrate the design uh, and development process that went into creating our Smart Track luggage tracker, and uh, we will also establish the engineering principles and concepts that were curated throughout the design process. The problem we set out to combat is lost luggage. Roughly 80,000 pieces of luggage lost down. That adds up to an annual $2.3 billion in cost. Roughly 1% of travelers are affected by mishandled baggage. While there is a degree of variance between airliners, the core problem still stands. Too many people are losing their baggage. Um, now, the first, uh, the first step in addressing the problem is establishing the clientele. Um, now, we found that our greatest prospective clients was normally uh, business travelers of the approximate age of about 35. Now, the benefit of this is the fact that we can um, market our product directly towards corporations and in bulk, as well as towards the consumers on an individual one-by-one -one basis. Um, this widens the uh, potential user base substantially. Before brainstorming a crucial step towards developing a perspective solution for assessing our solutions. From here, we found two products that we see the model ourselves after the track dimes you see above and the Adobe clone system, which gave us the idea of the model and the GPS JSON. Okay. Brainstorming process began with the standard idea matrix. The advantage of a scamper chart is the ability to connect ideas and stem up concepts freely. One build is one build idea for the creative. Okay, and uh, now we move on to the brainstorming process. Uh, through the brainstorming process, we created three primary solutions. We created a Bluetooth tracking system, um, an RFID tracking system, and then a GSM GPS tracking system. Uh, the first of which being our Bluetooth tracker. Now, our first concept, concept being the Bluetooth tracker uh, is a non-mobile unit. This means that the Bluetooth tracker would require a tag and reader system. Uh, this means that uh, it would have to be built in within airports, uh, creating very specific receivable receiver terminals which baggage which would pass through. Um, and if you know a piece of luggage was found at a terminal where it was not supposed to be found, it would ping and set off an alarm and notify authorities that hey, this luggage is in the wrong place. Now the second idea that we were coming off of was the idea of the RFID tag system. Now RFID means radio frequency identification system and it employs um, electromagnetic fields to automatically identify and track tags. 
Now, this sounds very compli uh, complicated and uh, overwhelming and intimidating at first, but really it's essentially the same idea as that uh, Bluetooth tracker that we have. We have uh, terminals that luggage would pass through, and you have tags in the reader system that would identify if a, if a uh, piece of luggage is in the right or wrong place. Um, now, the RFID tags that could either employ uh, autonomous local transmission or operator uh, or local operator transmission. And in essence, this means that the bags could either go on a conveyor belt and you know, be set off automatically, or an operator could scan them. So you could have a worker working with an RFID belt. And the final idea that we worked with was the idea of the GSM GPS tracker. Now, this employs GSM technology, which is the same exact thing that you have in your cell phone. It's uh, what you use to send an SMS message to a friend. Um, now, the great thing about GSM technology is the fact that it is a, um, it is a very self-contained unit. So, uh, GSM and GPS, uh, use, utilizing this technology, we could go and we could fit this system into the handle of a luggage system, or we could have a little independent tracker. Um, another benefit of this technology is the fact that um, it communicates directly with the consumer. The other two designs would have to go through airports. But uh, with this, we could go and we could have an application um, that users could have on their phone. It could update directly and tell you where your luggage is. Um, and this satisfies a very basic ideological desire that the two other designs fail to consider. And it's the fact that people have a very personal connection with their belongings. And by establishing a connection and communicating directly with the consumer, we can cut out the middleman and really <coughs> further that bridge between people and the things that they own. By implementing a decision matrix, we can objectively assess the different solutions on a practical level. Often when reaching a solution, it is easy to become emotionally attached to the design. The employment of the matrix helps to navigate this and maintain neutrality. Our design matrix lives towards the GSM GPS tree. Our next step is decision design justification was to gather a set of user input by using a system in conjunction with expert review which you have with our resumes. It is important to have both qualitative and quantitative input to gather to gain a clearer scope of the user's desires. From our reviews, we determined the companies would like a license to distribute all of their traveling distribute to all of their traveling employees instead of purchasing unit size and file one by one basis. We were urged to switch from a lithium ion battery design to a button cell battery. Okay, and here's our process tree. And uh, this explains the basic order of how things are going to work in the GPS GSM tracking system. Uh, so we start with the uh, front end of the mobile application. This is the GUI, the graphic user interface. And uh, these are those bright, big red buttons that you see that consumers love to press. And this is what's going to uh, pretty much trigger the uh, back end of our mobile application. And this is what consumers don't see. And uh, for us, this is what's sending the SMS message across over to our little GSM transmitter, which is a SIM 900 GSM transmitter uh, system. Um, and then upon, upon the prompt of that message, the uh, GSM transmitter says, hey, I have a message, and sends that to the Arduino. The Arduino, upon prompt of the GSM transmitter, says, okay, I've received a signal. It grabs um, a location from our GPS module and then pings that all the way back up the system. So it gets sent uh, from our GPS module up to the Arduino, you know, up to the GSM uh, transmitter, which sends an SMS all the way over to our cell phone, in which case it's put into a Google Maps GPS position system. So it creates a very complicated system and it's reduced down to something that seems very simple and intuitive for consumers. Um, I press a button and then I see where my luggage is. When really, in actuality, it's a very complicated system. Um, and now we have some uh, basic overview of some of the STEM principles that we've implemented in our design process. Um, from computer programming um, to dimensional analysis, the design process of the smart track luggage treasure has been a very math and science intensive process. And uh, here's a uh, basic parts list that we had for the design of our prototype. Um, this goes over the very uh, the, the core pieces of our design, such as the GPS shield or the uh, GSM shield uh, or the Arduino, um, but also includes a bunch of secondary things, such as uh, having jumper cables to connect between these parts. So can you tell us about our procedure? Our procedure is split into three pillars, development of the case, development of the back end, application, and development of the because we split our building, uh, building into 
that this wasn't really powerful enough for me to really work with and create what I want, the Android application that we needed, to create a uh, functional graphic user interface. So I eventually had to use uh, Java and XML files. And this is the basis of Android development. Um, and here we can see, you know, here's some XML files. Here's some of the Java files that we worked with. And if you look under our computer, uh, here's some more that we can look at. But, um, and this eventually led us uh, to creating the uh, second version of our application with uh, the big red buttons that says find my luggage and activate alarm. Um, and then we also have to work on the back-end development concurrently, uh, which uh, has a lot of the code that the Arduino and the GPS module uh, have to use to communicate with each other. Because they're not going to know to do that uh, initially, you have to tell them to do that. And um, eventually after more development, we were finally able to hone in on our third and final version of the application. And Quentin has his on his phone right now. We'll come and bring it up to you guys. Um, and from here, we have Find My Luggage button and the Activate Alarms button. And um, upon prompt of, you know, Find My Luggage and then send the GSM prompt, we are able to, you know, pinpoint a location. And I'd like to establish that this, it's a hard-coded location currently. I think you might have noticed when I was passing around the model, there's not a SIM card in it. Um, the reason why it's coming up is because we have it hard-coded right now. Um, integration between back end and front end is a very complicated process and it's something that we're still working on and uh, we want further. And uh, this will move us to testing. Here you can see a few of our tests that we did specifically on the door itself. Um, we tested the strength of the door being connected and the strength of the door on a um, single point of impact. Okay, and the industrial review, which you guys have already looked through, we got it from Dan Hickey, who is the father of a good friend of mine, and he works at General Motors, and he was uh, able to really give us some input on what we needed to change, and uh, possible you know, clients that we could address, uh, such as talking to corporations directly. Um, he also said that the integrated alarm system, which we had back here, um, could be a problem because it could uh, violate clear and present danger in the sense that, hey, if this went off on an airplane, um, this could cause, uh, it could be a threat in a sense, or it could uh, promote some sort of sense of terror or fear on an airplane. So that's something that we had to eliminate and really cut out. Um, so we have to thank him for that, and uh, this leads us to future improvements. <coughs> we've already started working on a lot of these, but the immediate design considerations that we had were integrating the mobile app and the GSM transmission system and really getting that to function a little bit more smoothly and really flesh that out. 
Um, and then also we, uh, with the case itself, we want to increase the size of prongs because if you look at it, you can see some of those prongs have already broken off and uh, reduce the material costs, such as uh, reducing the amount of you know, uh, ABS plastic used in printing. Um, and upon mass production, we're going to try to re really reduce the size of the GPS module in general and condense it down so that it can be a small module that can be placed in your luggage. And we can see uh, some of the actualizations of these uh, future improvements, such as uh, our design improvements with uh, increased prong size and reduced material costs by hollowing out this interior. There, I believe we have it as uh, about a centimeter in thickness, so we're reducing it to a half centimeter. Um, and of course, as we go through iterations, we can reduce even more, but it's, it's a good start. And um, here's our door, which we bulked up a little bit because that was our weakest part in our stress testing. And uh, in conclusion, this, uh, this design process has taught us a lot about engineering in general, uh, from conducting market research to personally teaching me about uh, the basics of Android programming and uh, working with the Arduino. Um, and while it has been difficult, it has been a very rewarding process, and I'm very happy to be part of it. So um, thank you, guys. Um, I'm Jake Julian. Uh, we'd like to thank Mr. Steve Score for being our instructor and the Wabanzi PLT program for uh, hosting this in general. None of this would ever happen without this uh, incredible program that we have here. So thank you. We are Smart Track for Incorporated. semi-autonomous workflow system. A little background on the problem. Ever since 1859, the United States has been pumping out oil. These initially started in land uh, in Pennsylvania, and as, as the need for oil grew, we started going to more risky and risky locations, eventually ending up in the ocean, going into the ocean, where uh, there are some very rough situations. Uh, oil spills are a very big problem to the environment, mostly because we cannot get to the oil spills fast enough. Usually oil spill lingers for weeks before the first EM efforts reach them. And the longer the oil stays in the ocean, the more damage it does. It sucks the oxygen out of the water and kills the native wildlife there. Uh, along with that, most of the cleanup methods that are being currently used are very lethal to the wildlife. And when the marine ecosystem starts dying out, uh, it affects the entire globe. Uh, so, uh, according to the American Institute of Biological Sciences, Oil spill kill birds, uh, mammals, and other uh, like fish and marine mammals through suffocating them and just coating them so that their bodily functions don't uh, go through properly. Uh, there are currently there are many solutions being used to clean up oil spills. These include skimmers, containment plumes, and other different types of combination of plumes and boats. Skimmers work uh, pretty effectively, and many of these companies have uh, used, spent multi millions of dollars to uh, develop new and better skimmers but they're not being delivered there fast enough. That's what we, that's the problem that we're going to be working on. Uh, booms uh, during high rough seas will go over the booms and in very few situations have they been implemented properly. Uh, the correct uh, dis chemical dispersant is extremely lethal to wildlife. It's, it comes the oil together and sinks it to the bottom of the ocean instead of actually cleaning it up. It was used in uh, the BP oil spill and what it does is it comes up the oil which the very bottom of the food chain consumes. So when the bottom of the food chain dies because it's consuming indigestible oil, it begins to die. And the worst solution, one of the worst solutions is burning the oil that we collect. And these are problems that we wanted to fix. Uh, so we wanted to create something that was cheap, easily deployable, and did, no, did less harm to the environment. Our constraints were $300 because we didn't want to spend more than that on our class. We only had 19 weeks to do it, and we wanted to incorporate our knowledge from previous hobbies and activities that we have learned in school. Uh, so, so eventually, we um, some of the laws and regulations that have to do with putting things out in the sea, especially as you may have seen autonomous things, we have to first of all worry about hacking and uh, collision with boats. There are international regulations in place that say you have to have somebody looking out at, on a ship to make sure you don't know, uh, crash into something. Um, but however, we do know that SpaceX uses their drone boats, uh, and so they have legal exception for that. Also, a Taiwanese company called MGM, I believe, uh, converted an oil super tanker into a skimmer in response to the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, and the Coast Guard, and they went to the Coast Guard, and the Coast Guard gave them permission to put that experimental vessel. So there are <coughs> channels we can use to test our product in a real life scenario, and there is precedence for autonomous devices in the ocean. So these are some of our design concepts, some of like the ideas that we came up 
to analyze what materials we should be using to construct our final prototype, how, like, how it would affect the environment. And in terms of technology, we're using our communication along with GPS magnetometers and accelerometers to uh, analyze the location and figure out where the boat should be going. Uh, we use CAD software and uh, the design development matrices to find our final solution. And we use math and basic tri trigonometry to uh, figure out which direction our boat should be heading based on where the boat is pointing and the difference in the GPS locations. So our expert contact was uh, a man by the name of Richard Sperr. He has um, a Bachelor of Sciences and a director at CMS World Group. Um, on the right, you see um, a Catamaran model he made of GravCat. This is something that he does. He um, has a lot of experience working as a shipwright, with, um, building these small model boats. And we thought that if we wanted to build a prototype on our own, he'd be the ideal person. Here's a uh, picture of our correspondence with him. He, this was over uh, GrabCat, and he gave us some tips about uh, justifying our problem and how to do it. So this is our first design. You can see at the center we have um, a triangular hull meant for slicing the water effectively, and on the side we have these uh, circular buoys meant to kind of keep it stable. Um, uh, we very quickly realized that there is no point in trying to build our own boat when bars already exist. Ultimately, if we have a big work boat, it's going to be carrying oil and vacuuming systems and other kinds of things, and it needs to be very uh, strong motor to tow uh, skimmers behind it. So we just said we should build something like a barge. You can see that's the, that's the top of the barge on the left, and on the right is the fuel tank. And this is the exploded, so you can see the fuel tank rests inside those two metal plates. And in the front, near the uh, bow of the ship, is a big container for oil, and at the top this fits over. Oh, okay. in terms of the power plan, uh, within, uh, for what was uh, feasible within the scope of our 19 weeks, we decided to do the technological end of this because we did not have the time to build a full 40-foot barge and uh, like work on all the kinks that come with that. So we just created the technology that would allow for autonomous boats to clean up oil spills and allow for a structure that allows for manual override in case it's doing something that it's not supposed to be doing. And manual override is very important in the ocean because we don't want to damage wildlife any more than is already being affected by oil. And this will re uh, dramatically reduce the amount of damage that could be done to wildlife. Uh, we first did a cost analysis for a full-size barge. And after accounting for the motor, the construction cost, and we want to make it an electric boat to minimize the noise pollution that is a big epidemic in the ocean. It all came down to uh, 10 grand and change. Then uh, we analyzed our prototype cost. So after including all the electronics, which is the major cost of the boat, 
along with the hull and motors and the controllers for the motors. It came to $164. So I'm going to break down exactly what that cost, how that cost came from, and what we're exactly talking about. So at the top we have um, the, the wireless module, which is how we get a computer to digitally communicate with uh, the boat. We also have the accelerometer, the IMU, or the inertial measurement unit. That contains a magnetometer, which essentially the Earth's magnetic field. It contains an accelerometer, which lets us measure its you know, acceleration and reaction. And it contains a gyro gyroscope, which lets it measure you know, the way the boat is rotating. Uh, it also has a GPS on board, which uh, lets it communicate with GPS satellites to determine its heading, position, time. Uh, we also have the Arduino Kuno, which is a tracking controller, which ties all of these things together. <coughs> we also have uh, the plastic hull, a six channel radio for manual control and simulating manual control. We also have uh, the lithium ion battery, which we eventually switched over to um, cadmium, so we can save them. And a uh, electronic speed control. So, construction of this started by taking the boat bar offline, getting rid of all the peripherals, um, taking out all the screws, and getting access to the internals. There's a lot of uh, classic structure inside, so we used a Dremel and got rid of all of that, so we fit all the electronics, but we did use all the space inside this for wiring. Um, after that, we, uh, we wanted to use a purple, we wanted to solder everything so it didn't fall apart, but then we quickly realized that it's either just the breadboard, so that's what we ultimately did. Um, we passed wires through the comp right here, where all the wires come out, and we wired everything up to the battery, and the motor's come out. Uh, this is a picture of the, uh, us making the ESC. We initially wanted to use H bridges, which allows us to control motors in both directions, and it encapsulates all the electronics into one chip. Eventually, we decided that it's just too difficult to make this on a breadboard, so we just decided to go with a TIP120 power transistors, which is a Darlington array, which is two transistors in uh, a lot made in a fashion so that one transistor <coughs> is used to amplify the motor. Um, See, we have the resistors and the diodes all, uh, all breadboarded in there. And this is the view inside the boat. At the bow of the boat, we have the microcontroller. In the center is the breadboard that has the IMU, the GPS, and the ESC. And at the back are the two motors. So to test all these things together, because we do have a lot of parts that need to be put together, we started by testing the GPS. Uh, this was with the example code provided by the people who sell the GPS, and this we were able to take any, any what's called an NMEA sentence, which is just the raw output of the GPS. We were able to parse that and turn it, transform it from you know just text into uh, something readable. Uh, we then went through to each and every uh, what we had and made sure they all work, and made sure the ESC isn't put up too much. Um, so here's some of the uh, changes we made. We realized the GPS could get a proper fix without an antenna. We also, as I said before, we ditched the H-bridge. So that's a picture of what the H-bridge would have looked like. It's pretty nasty. And we also, again, switched from her. So uh, when you started testing it, you test, uh, we used debugging and serial monitors to check what the Arduino's to see. Uh, we start with just the art of communication. Uh, we start with simple bytes, uh, just with ones and zeros being sent over the radio. Eventually went to character arrays where you could set more complex sentences. And eventually, where we could set long GPS data uh, across long distances. This was just communicating the string and uh, just a single string and the GPS location. Uh, and over here is when we were going back and forth, where it isn't this more than one-way communication. It sends data there and then it receives data from the ship to see what's up with the ship. Uh, this again, sort of uh, how we proceeded through our process. And here's some terms that are important. So now this was all the concept. Now let's see the boat work in practice. Because after all, this is a technology demonstration meant to display the technology that would be working in an actual work boat. So one of the primary ideas of cement on this work boat is that a, an operator can at any time be controlled. So right now I have it set up so that I can control When I push the boat forward, the motor spin. Right. I push the motor to the right, see just one motor spins up, the boat curves to the left. To the left, just this motor spins up to the left, and we have the throughout the entirety of the joystick area. And 
now, and I'll do the second component of this, is that we want a autonomous system. We want an operator to be able to control it from a distance without <coughs> worrying about its exact heading. So what I can do is just by pressing the switch, I leave manual control, and now it's an automatic. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, we'd like to uh, type go, which hit enter. Along with using GPS coordinates, it will plot out different points that the two boats have to follow for it to uh, clean up the oil. And this is just like to launch a demonstration for like why it would, uh, like how it would interpret the data that's getting from all these different sensors and put them all together. Absolute manual control over it at any given time to avoid any potentially dangerous situation. 